Hi everyone, so here's the screencast. I had a little technical difficulties today. Uh, just a reminder, your quiz is on chapters 16 and 17. Uh, we had an opportunity to cover 16 well, although I would encourage you to study it, uh, of course. But I did want to go over chapter 17 with you in a little bit more depth. So yesterday, uh, we had a chance to talk about Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations and the influence that his ideas, especially the ideas of laissez-faire, that government should not get involved with business and industry, that they shouldn't regulate, uh, had on America. And I, I found the date that the Wealth of Nations was published to be very interesting, that clearly this was uh, influential in that it was very popular at the same time. So we talked about that. The Horatio Alger myth sometimes referred to as the idea that the idea that um, rags to riches, the social motivation behind this economic philosophy, that anyone with, with hard work and industry can rise uh, to great wealth in this country. It was a strong influence on, on this attitude. One other things that influence this attitude is social Darwinism. Uh, look at this guy. Uh, what a great picture. So Herbert Spencer is often given credit for coming up with this idea. And I always found it interesting. You know, we're all familiar with Darwin and survival of the fittest. And his ideas were kind of manipulated to encourage this economic philosophy. Uh, just like the giraffe with the tallest neck survives to have baby giraffes, uh, the best business, the best workers uh, thrive and survive. Uh, Darwin himself was very upset that his ideas were used for, for this purpose, uh, and he, he said that he was talking about survival of the species, not survival of the best business or the best worker. But nonetheless, this idea played a really important role in uh, the, the popular uh, ad adoption of laissez-faire. So I wanted to put this together kind of briefly because we spent a lot of time on Rockefeller and Carnegie in class, so I didn't feel the need to do it uh, online. But when we look at these two guys, even though they're very similar in, in some regards, certainly their charity, they're very different in others. Uh, Rockefeller, of course, has a horizontal integration. So he does not control all aspects of production, but he virtually controls one aspect of construct uh, one aspect of production, specifically oil refineries. Uh, he controlled over 90% of the oil refineries. If you needed your oil refined, you needed to go through Rockefeller. That's a horizontal integration. Um, both of these men are known for their philanthropy. Uh, there's a great story about Rockefeller wanting to get an honorary doctorate from Harvard, Harvard refusing him, and him building his own college, the University of Chicago. Interestingly enough, it's sometimes called the Harvard of the West. And he hires away a number of, of Harvard's faculty. It's kind of uh, just a great story about, you know, uh, what you can do with a lot of money. He gives over $200 million away in charity. He was known for walking around with dimes and would give dimes to um, children. But a lot of that, some people uh, said, was part of a public image campaign. Uh, Rockefeller, his great nickname given to him by Carnegie, Rockefeller was known for destroying people. That's what the Cleveland Massacre refers to when Rockefeller drove a tremendous amount of people out of business in Cleveland. And it was really the beginning of his monopoly. Uh, Rockefeller, for his uh, side of it, said that he gave this analogy of the American rose. And he said, a rose can't really grow beautiful and big if there's a lot of them. So just like you go out into the garden and you trim your roses and, and uh, cut the, the small ones out to have one big, beautiful flower, that's what Rockefeller thought he was doing with his monopoly. Um, Carnegie, on the other hand, is very different in many ways. So he has vertical integration. So he uh, focused on owning every aspect of production. And by controlling all aspects of production, he could limit price and uh, provide his steel at a much cheaper price. Similarly, Carnegie's charity, his philanthropy is very famous. 90% of his charity went to libraries, Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Mellon University. We talked earlier about uh, Carnegie and in, in the, in the Tuskegee Institute. Um, Carnegie, though, and, some, and certainly Rockefeller would, would be included in, the, in this, are oftentimes referred to as robber barons because of their treatment of workers 
and even the product that they provided sometimes at a very high cost, uh, especially with Rockefeller. I find it interesting that Carnegie, you know, Scottish immigrant, uh, made his fortune in, in Pittsburgh, uh, is buried very close by in Sleepy Hollow. Um, so that's just a point of interest. There's different types of monopolies, and I'm just going to go here to the bottom, and I'm, I'm glad to explain these. But really, what you need to know about all of these monopolies is that they each limit competition. The idea that monopolies limit competition is the most important part of all these different monopolies. And when you have limited competition, prices, of course, go up, and that's awful. But not only do prices go up, you have less innovation. You have less uh, motivation to innovate because you don't have to worry about competition. So let's go through this a little bit. Um, trusts are oftentimes seen as large corporations uh, that combine together. Um, oftentimes there's a board of directors that controls the trust. They divide stock and making these companies so big and so large, smaller companies really can't compete against them. They can cut prices longer. They can uh, drive other companies out of business. So, so that's a trust. An interlocking directory and Rockefeller was, was a great example of this, would be people who were on these boards of directors for many different companies. So if you're on the board of director for an oil company and you're also on the board of directors for a railroad company, you can manipulate the railroad company to provide uh, cheap transport of your oil. And vice versa, you can make sure that your oil company that, that uh, actually hires a lot of railroads is a big business to the railroads uses certain railroads. So these interlocking directories really provided for a, a tremendous amount of corruption. Pools are oftentimes described as uh, agreements that they'll that companies will divide uh, certain areas. This was very common in railroads. You know, building railroads was very expensive. So if you could divide up the country and say, well, we'll take the west, you take the east, we'll take the south, uh, it limited competition and made things uh, much less expensive for the business owners. And of course, we talked a lot about vertical and horizontal already. Um, speaking of railroads, there's this guy, Stephen Ambrose, or that he, he died, but he wrote a book called Nothing Like It in the World. And the idea that the transcontinental railroad literally uh, transforms America. You could argue that the railroad is one of, if not the single most important inventions in American history because of all the, the impact that it has. So what does it do? It creates a national market. So before the railroads, generally things were produced and sold locally. Now you could make a, a hat store, for example, and since the, the country's your market, not just upstate New York, not just the South, you know, since the entire country's your market, you can mass produce. Um, mass production leads to mass consumption. It really changes the entire economy of the United States. Economic specialization. You can never have just a hat company before and, and, and make it uh, overly profitable. So now you can specialize in a particular uh, product, whatever that product is. There's a great line that the railroads were so powerful that they literally stopped time. You know, the reason that we have the time zones that we have today and the reason that we have standardized time today is because the railroads needed to run on a certain standardized time. They needed to know that if it's 12 o'clock in St. Louis, it's 3 o'clock in Los Angeles, and they need to be able to say what time they're going to show up at Lo to Los Angeles. The modern time zones that we have today literally come from the railroads. And last but certainly not least, the way that we think of stocks today. Uh, comes from the railroads. Railroads are incredibly expensive to build and it's all money up front. You have to put a tremendous amount of money into these railroads before you collect one dollar. So this is going to lead to uh, the modern way that companies raise money, which is of course stocks. So it's hard to uh, over, it's hard to overemphasize the importance of railroads. Social impact of railroads, we see uh, workers, Chinese and, and Irish immigrant workers, the, the growth of the West, uh, it, it allowed people to go to the West in greater numbers, needless to say. And speaking of railroads, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Well, Cornelius Vanderbilt is one of these robber barons slash captains of industry. 
Uh, he started out in shipbuilding, and that's why he had the nickname as the Commodore. Uh, Vanderbilt was able to consolidate railroads and use pools to create a monopoly, particularly in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, he had a particularly uh, bad reputation. At one point, he was going to cancel a railroad to a town. And this railroad not only brought people, but it brought the mail. And a criticism was levied on him. Someone said to him, how can you do that? What about the people? What about the public? How will they get their mail? And Vanderbilt uh, allegedly said, the public be damned. Not exactly a nice guy. A little bit more of a, a, little bit more of a robber baron. Um, J.P. Morgan. We're all familiar with that name, he, uh, of course, uh, today. Um, he was called the Banker's Banker. And he's not a captain of industry, but he is a guy who was able to consolidate many of these businesses. So he'd buy railroads and he'd consolidate them into one. He actually bought out Carnegie and turned Carnegie's steel company into U.S. Steel, which became the first billion dollar company. And these are these are just examples of what JP Morgan did. JP Morgan would raise the money cuz who could buy out Carnegie? Carnegie's going to become the single richest individual in in America at the time. Uh, one person couldn't buy him out. So what Morgan did was as a banker, he raised the capital um, he bought the companies. He often combined and consolidated these companies and got rid of companies that um, were competition, creating trusts and monopolies, and was able to uh, make huge amounts of money. And of course, the name J.P. Morgan uh, is still with us today, Chase Morgan, for example. And, and I had to show you a picture of the guy because look at that. Um, you know, he, he had a very distinctive uh, face. Well, all of this, and I'm looking at the clock, I've got one eye on the clock, I, I always keep it to 15 minutes because I, I kind of have to, so I'm going to try to go through this quickly. All of this uh, industrialization and the changing, uh, the changing role of the American worker, the changing role of the American worker from working on the farm or working in a small shop to working in a factory uh, is going to lead to the demand for labor unions. Workers feel that they're being oppressed, that they're being poorly treated, that they're not being paid a living wage, and this is going to lead to the rise of labor unions. So I'm going to do this very quickly because the, we're going to see a progression in terms of these labor unions. So the first labor union that we talk about is the National Labor Union. Um, they were a much more liberal labor union. They're, they're not long-lasting. Uh, the economic depression of 1873 hurt them, you know, when the economy's bad. People are less willing to join labor unions uh, because they feel that they, you know, I have to accept a job. I can't go out on strike, for example. But this is important because it's the first. The Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor was a labor union that was very inclusive. Um, the idea was that everyone was welcome. Minorities were welcome, which, of course, we've talked a lot about. That might be surprising to you uh, considering the time. The first president was a guy by the name of Terrence Powderly. And they believed that there was strength and unity with everyone. And you might say, like, well, isn't that a labor union? Like, all the workers unite. We're going to see there's different types of labor unions. This labor union attempted to unite everyone, from the skilled mechanic to the guy who, who maybe just picked up the boxes and, and, and uh, threw them into the back of a truck. Uh, everyone was welcome. The Knights of Labor was very, very popular until a singular event, and this is very rare that one single event has such a huge impact, known as the Hay Square bombing, uh, the Haymarket Square bombing. The Haymarket Square bombing was actually the work of anarchists, but it was at a Knights of Labor rally. And the Knights of Labor were kind of penned as radical and extreme, even though they hadn't done it. And this is going to destroy the Knights of Labor. They're replaced, I shouldn't say they're replaced, but the next labor union that we talk about is the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, led by Samuel Gompers. Um, now, earlier I said that the Knights of Labor uh, united everyone. Um, the AFL only worked with skilled workers. The idea, if you were a skilled worker, you had more leverage. They put forth this idea of collective bargaining, which is in the news all the time today, even to this day. There are states that want to get rid of this because it generally benefits workers. Collective bargaining, as the name implies, that the union bargains for everybody. So there's strength in numbers, especially with skilled workers. Uh, let's think of that mechanic who's going to put the machine back together. 
if he goes out and the machine is broken, there's nothing that can be done. This is called bread and butter unionism. It's a little review for you. I hope it helps.